Next on BBC Two, Kelly Monteith strains for laughs in his contribution to the decline of Western civilization. Oh! What's wrong? I can't get this stupid blind to go up. <laughs> Suzanne, come on. <laughs> it's so simple. Look, all you have to do is you just you just pull it down a little bit, and then you snap your wrist, and it reverses the spring, and it goes right. Back. <laughs> you were saying? We have to snap pretty hard, you know, like most mechanical things, it's all in the in the wrists. As soon as I get the right wrist action, it's gonna go up with no problem. I just snap my wrist right. <laughs> okay, love, that's your wiring fixed. You can What's going on here? My husband, the wrist snapping mechanical genius, is trying to get the blind to go back up. Hey, that's no problem, love. It's just a matter of triggering this little spring up here, like this. Hi, I'm Kelly Monteith, and welcome to episode seven of Kelly Monteith BBC Memories. When I see this kind of scene, I just wonder how many people ever had this problem with the window shade and the second thing is, I wonder how many people remember what a window shade is. Do they still have those roll up and roll down window shades? I don't think they do. <laughs> but anyway, this was the cold opening of uh, series two, which um, to me was kind of a, a, a troubled series. To, it, I, I came to, um, to Britain unprepared because of, of a series of all kinds of things that happened. I got another show in America and it took away my time from writing the shows. And Neil Shan, by the way, was my co-writer. And what I used to do is write the shows in America and then bring them over and then he and I would tear them apart and, and rewrite them, basically. And that was Neil's strength, really. He was really good at taking a script and not just punching it up, but just adding so much to it. But anyway, series two, I think I really let uh, Gabrielle down because on the first series she had so much more to do and now she became basically a housewife because we didn't have a lot of time um, to build sets or to film and stuff. So basically we, we had this, we were stuck with this flat set. So we had to do everything around it. And that's why we have scenes like we have uh, that's coming up. The uh, first one is about um, a television that goes bad, which I'm sure a lot of people, uh, especially in the old days, remember when, when the, the TV was something, what happened to the TV and what they do to try and fix it. For instance, on television. Now, if something goes wrong with the TV, my first impulse is to do like what most people do, to pound and to bang. And that never works. So I end up calling a TV repairman who drives all the way out to my flat and uses his years of highly skilled training in electronic technology to fix my set. Here it is. Watch your step on the cord there. See? Uh-huh. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's 80 quid. Cheerio. Wow. Really cramped in here. No wonder I had back pain all those years. Anyway, this next uh, little uh, repairman is the oven repairman. Well, for one thing, the door opens the wrong way. Huh? I've never seen one like that before. Australian, is it? <laughs> and the pilot light's been acting up, too. Fine. But I'll have to send somebody over to fix that oven door. Well, can't you fix it? No, nah, I'm a service engineer. That's a job for maintenance. Well, that's what they all say. Look, I just want somebody to fix it. Well, if he's got the right part, I'm sure the next bloke will. Well, can't he make sure he's got the right part before he comes all the way out here? Well, how does he know what part he needs until he sees what's wrong? Well, can't you tell him what part he needs? Well, I don't know who it'll be. The gas pool's like the Secret Service. We only know what we need to know in case we're captured. <laughs> That actor was Derek Griffiths. I always wanted to work with him. Um, I always wanted to try and bring a little more diversity into the show, which really wasn't, you know, on either side of the Atlantic. There wasn't a lot of diversity on television at the, in those days. It was 41 years ago, okay? 
Um, but I, I, I really liked his work and I thought he did a great job. Next we're going to do a little thing. Um, we're going to start out with uh, something I don't always like to show on this, but it's a little part of my monologue um, that I did. Uh, we didn't call them monologues, it was just a, a way to set things up. It's kind of based on um, when I was in the back seat of uh, our Ford that my mom was trying to teach my sister how to drive a stick shift. And as really the basis of, of this of this little monologue that I do, and then it segues into um, a part with uh, myself and Gabrielle, who plays, of course, my wife, and uh, the difficulty of uh, a woman trying to reassert her right to drive uh, like a man. Check it out. See, when I was in school, we had a driver's education class. I'll never forget that because the, the teacher I really admired was a guy that taught that class. The man had more patience than any man I've ever seen. Because the car we had, had, well, it didn't have automatic. It had a manual transmission, you know, gear level uh, shift there, see. Now, most of the guys in school knew how to drive it already. Because when their father wasn't home, they'd go out and practice with the car in the driveway or on the street or whatnot, see. But the girls didn't care. They had other interests, so they could care less about the car. Now, this guy had to teach them. Now, I'll tell you something. You don't know what patience is. So you've taught someone how to drive a stick shift automobile. I don't know how this man did it. He'd go through it eight hours a day. Okay, Alice. Now that you have the car in first gear, I want you to slowly let the clutch out. Now, at the same time that you're letting the clutch out, you press in on the accelerator pedal and the car will move forward. You got that? Okay, now let's try it. <laughs> a little more acceleration. <laughs> No, Alice, just a little more on the accelerator pedal. No, not too much on the clutch. A little more petrol, please. Never lost his patience. All the guys would be in the back seat just bitching, for God's sakes. What's the matter with her, anyway? God forbid if you had it after lunch. Oh, God. I ain't gonna make it. Now, he had a different kind of problem with the guys. Okay, Harold, you want to put the car in first gear? <laughs> Good shift, Harold. The man was amazing. And the courage this guy had. He had more courage. I saw this man in situations where everybody else in the car was bailing out the back windows in panic. And he never once lost his cool. Well, actually, Mary Jane, the law states you should stop and look before crossing the railroad tracks. <laughs> not directly on them. Now, if you will, please, let's pull off so we can give the right away to this diesel <laughs> that is bearing down upon us. That's right. Whoop, no, more petrol. No, more pet. Oh, God, please, more petrol! <laughs> hey, he's now a drunk in Philadelphia. <laughs> It's interesting about driving. It always seems to have been a sore spot between men and women. Of course, it still is, if Suzanne and I are any criterion. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to drive. Why can't I drive? Scared I'm going to be better than you? <laughs> no, I'm just scared. <laughs> you're just sexually insecure. I'm what? Well, you said yourself. A man sees a car as an extension of his virility. Thank God we got rid of the mini. <laughs> you drive. Thank you. Aren't you going to get into the car? No, I'm going to let you get out of this parking place first. You got in, you get out. By the way, the sister I was talking about was my sister Judy, who I'm still close with, and uh, we grew up together in a very small house in, in Kirkwood, Missouri. As I mentioned earlier, Series 2 was, uh, I suppose it had what they call a, a sophomore curse on it, <laughs> to me anyway. 
and the show that we were doing, we came up short of time. So we needed something to fill that up. We had no time to build other sets. We had no time to do this, that, or the other, or get more actors. So what we did was um, I went back to the hotel and um, I wrote a little, uh, I guess you call it a sketch, even though it was part of the, part of the show. Um, we didn't refer to it as a sketch. And then I went back to the office and rewrote it with Neil. And this, we came up with this, um, my attempt at fixing the plumbing in the house with the help of um, something you probably don't know what it is, a record. Hello. Hello. You're listening to the Mr. Fix-It Home Plumbing Repair Kit. Mm -hmm. One of a series which includes the Mr. Fix-It Electrical Repair Kit, mm -hmm. the Mr. Fix-It Television Repair Kit, mm -hmm. and of course, the Dr. Fix-It Heart Pacemaker Repair Kit. <laughs> Heart Pacemaker Repair Kit? Your kit should include hot and cold taps, plus mixer, a water screen, four rubber washers, three bolts, mm -hmm. four nuts, a can of putty, mm -hmm. a record, mm -hmm. and two tufts of cotton to clean the record. <laughs> <laughs> now we really are ready to begin. Oh, to get to work. All yours. Thank you. Now, first of all, lay out your tools. Already done that. Your tool should include a spanner. Okay. A screwdriver. A screwdriver. A hammer. A hammer. A rag, a rag, a bone, and a hank of hair. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little home repair humor. <laughs> now, first of all, turn off the water at the mains. Okay. Failure to do this will mean that you'll have to rush out and buy the Mr. Fix-It home flooding kit. <laughs> Susie, where's the main water valve? The main water valve can usually be found at the bottom of the pipes leading to the taps in the cabinet underneath the sink. Bottom of the pipes leading to the taps in the cabinet underneath the sink. I found them! Well done! <laughs> now, take the spanner and rotating in a counterclockwise direction, unscrew the sperm flange from the split valve. <laughs> it may be rusty from the water, so I'll pause for a few moments while you loosen it. Hey, what the hell's a sperm flange? I have no idea, but right now I wish your father had had one. <laughs> okay. Give what? me the dictionary. What's Where's... that? Oh, dictionary. Sperm flange, sperm flange, sperm flange. Here we go. Sperm flange, sperm flange, sperm whale, sperm counts. Now that you've... Wait! The... <laughs> Sorry. Here, sperm flange. Here it is. C, nerf nozzle. <laughs> what the hell's a nerf nozzle? The nerf nozzle is a small metal protrusion at the juncture of the sperm flange and the split valve. Okay, wait. Okay. Oh, no! Kelly, what have you done now? I broke off the nerf nozzle. <laughs> damn it! <laughs> damn stupid asinine kid! Who's the damn idiot that made... Break off the nerf nozzle and discard it. Hey! <laughs> How do you like that? I'm cleverer than I thought. With the split valve now wide open, okay. remove the pipe. Okay, everything's going fine, Mr. Fix-It. <laughs> hey, what'd I tell you, Suzanne, huh? Piece of cake. So finally, take the rag and wipe off all the surrounding pipes and your spanner, your hammer, and your screwdriver. <laughs> Wait a minute, shouldn't I do that later? Mr. Fix-It believes that the only good tool is a clean tool. Well, so do I, but what's that got to do with plumbing? <laughs> <laughs> now, Turn on the main water valve and clear the air from the pipes before you can operate your new taps. I haven't even put the new Don't taps Don't be alarmed on. if you hear a strange sound. This is common with new taps. Well, I guess you know what you're talking about, Mr. Fixit, but I can't help thinking that I'm missing something. By the way, this is what a, a record looks like. This is an old 45 that, uh, that uh, good God, Perry Como. That was, uh, that was the uh, episode number seven, if I'm right. And I hope you enjoyed it. And please uh, tune in next week for more of Kelly Montese BBC Memories. Thank you, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.